about any, the Wahal philosophy of any. He said, but I'm going to give you our philosophy of any Wahal. Sweetheart, boys, in my head. Thank you. <laughs> and that was it. I'm, I'm serious. I, I kind of stood there and waited for Eddie to keep talking. He removed the microphone, walked on down, probably, probably found the room where the beer was at. And anyway, I was just like every other high school kid coming out now. For those of us who went to the server and played for Chow Court, you know that was such a pleasure <coughs> experience. Um, that's great coaching. Uh, and, but just like hitters, when I got to college, I really thought I had everything figured out as far as pitching. Every high schooler, hitting, pitching, they really think, they really think they know what to do. It's sometimes it's most pleasurable working with JV kids because they still want they still want that knowledge. By the time they get to be a little bit later, they're a little reluctant to change. You know, they hit 400 and travel ball when they were 10 years old. Therefore, they know everything they can possibly know about him. But I go to college first couple of days, you know, it's just freshman practicing. You know, I'm throwing my high school basketball. I'm probably mid over 80s. Curveball management. I don't know. So upperclassman comes out, upperclassman come out and scream just the first time and I face him. Uh, a junior and Al Hurt from West Ashton. And I give him my best high school fastball. And not only does he hit it about 500 feet, but he pulls it down the road, down the old college park in Charleston. So the best motivation I ever had to develop a breaking ball was having one, I was shocked that he hit it so far, two, he pulled, I mean, he pulled it out the road. And uh, so at that point, I realized that I needed to pay a little bit more attention to what I was doing and I needed to learn how to be successful on the mound because obviously the fastball that got me through in high school wasn't going to work in college. Um, so as I continue to coach, I continue to look, and you, you just like me, we have to cross train, we have to work with pitchers, we have to work with hitters. And as I continue to listen to people speak about hitters, and I kept asking questions, there was a few things that I learned by looking at hitters to illustrate their weaknesses to know where they're, you should attack them at. I had some really great teammates, the civil Jeff Barkley uh, was one that come to mind. He would sit pregame when he was gonna start that game. He was our Friday starter. He would sit down, we all had to come out and watch BP. And I still remember my first occasion in college, we were away the University of North Carolina, DJ Sir Hulk was on that team, Walt Weiss, Scott Bankhead, and, and my eyes just got totally open. And they had a great big old first baseman, had to be 6'5", 240, and he just hit one. He's taking BP, and he's just killing it. I mean, it was pretty safe to do down the line in college park. He's hitting him across the four lane road into the old Burbank, our old park on the other side of the road. You see it hit the basketball court and bounce up. And I'm thinking right now, what in the world have I got myself into? And Jeff is looking down, he glances up and says, can you break the ball? I said, what are you talking about? He said, you watch him when he strides. You see his head move forward? And he still hasn't looked back up. And I watched him, his head slip forward. He said, he threw what we call back then a fork ball, what they call now a split finger. Um, he gave that kid three times that day. Made him look silly. So then I got to keep looking and looking at kids. And I got to be honest with you, I work these camps, and, and this is the speech that I give Monday night at 7 o'clock when I'm talking to hitters. Because uh, they just got up and brought me over to talk. I said, I want you to talk to hitters about what you recognize as pitchers. 
and how you should attack them. Half the things they do, they don't know why they do it. They see it on TV, it looks cool. Well, you know what? I need to do that. I was the same way in high school. When I was, from, when I was in high school, no one Ryan J.R. Richards. They were playing for the Astros, and I would change my motion in the middle of innings. Didn't know anybody. Well, I learned as a pitcher, I started from the feet and moved up. Okay, start from the feet and moved up. We can stand. Now, first thing I want to talk to you, and I hope everybody can see me. Got a nice little phone bill I'll borrow from somebody. First thing I learned as a pitcher, and, and, and it, it changes over time. I'm not going to call out a high school, but I went to see my son play with a ball a couple years ago and during the summer. And uh, there, there's a rather large high school in South Carolina. I'm sitting there and I'm sitting there and I have a clue who I am. And, I'm <coughs> who I am. and their players are drifting in the hit. And they've got a very pronounced open stands. Now, I don't know exactly when the open stand started, but the first guy I could ever remember having an open stance was a guy that I played with and he wore glasses. And because he had he didn't want to look through that nose piece, he had to open his stance a little bit. So instead of looking through the nose piece of his glasses, he opened his head up a little bit more so he could see. Makes sense. <coughs> so I'm watching these kids and they got an open stance and right when they get the stride, boom, they're falling in. As a pitcher, that told me that their weight is falling into the plate. They're off balance. So how am I going to attack them? Inside. I'm going right on their hands. Okay? When I was growing up, I dated myself a little bit. San Francisco Giants had a great big first baseman named Will Clark. Left-handed hit. Probably. 6'5", six, 6'6". Six, six. Now, he was getting paid to hit home runs. I, I'm not, now I can look back, and I completely understand. He was getting paid, he wasn't getting paid to hit singles, he wasn't getting paid to hit doubles, he was being paid <coughs> to hit home runs. Will Clark had a very pronounced close stance. As he strided, he fell back. Great big man, he extended his arms, had a big looping swing. I paid a lot of money, and that was what he did. But if I see a high schooler do that, and I've already know that he's falling back, then I want to attack as far away from his eyes as we can. Okay? Uh, that's where I started. Now, the open stance, you see a lot of open stance nowadays, you don't see it in close stance as we used to, but we do see a lot of open stance. Next thing I look, I look at is simply the place of how they, how they stand in the box. Okay? Uh, you kind of want your feet to be parallel. I don't want your feet to be parallel, to be honest with you. BB cores, I tell these kids, you know, BB cores have done for pitchers what the three-point line in basketball has done for jump shooters. This brought pitching back into the game. If you can throw strikes now, and you can not walk people, and you can play defense, you've given your team a chance. It doesn't have to be 85, 95. All it's got to be is just throw it across the play. Especially when kids will allow them, they'll get themselves out if you let them. Three one counts, that's not a good count. We go strike one. Uh, over my years, I've been very fortunate to work with some really good people. John Pulaski, uh, <coughs> Kevin O'Sullivan, and Clemson. Uh, John Pulaski actually did a study one year, got all the copies, this is for. College was on TV, got all the college 
film that he possibly did. He, he charted every game. And it was some phenomenal percentage that batters in college take the first pitch like 89% of the time. Striking the ball, they're not going to swing the first pitch. And so I don't want to get real complicated. Until I, you know, and there's going to be a kid, we can all face kids who are going to be first pitch fastball hitters. They may be one or two a game, one or two a team. So if they're not a first pitch fastball hitter, I've got a leadoff hitter that plays for me that drives me nuts. Because the first time doing the order, he pretty much does what he's supposed to do. You see a lot of pitches. But then the second time, he's still up there taking first pitch fastballs right down the middle of the play. Drives me crazy. Almost think about giving hit and run. But no, no count. Nobody up. <laughs> Just to get him to swing the bat. Oh. So John Blouse taught me, look, <coughs> throw fastballs to first pitch. Until you know you've got a kid who's going to swing first pitch fastball, then we're just going to throw fastball. We're not going to get complicated. Next thing I learned to look at was when a kid gets in his stance, and I'll, I'll try to turn this way, if he's got this front foot pivoted already over, if you notice, when I just rotate on my heels, where does my hips go? They're already opening up. He's already coming off the pitch. That tells me away. Right? I don't know why, but we're seeing a lot more kids nowadays, if you look at their back foot, the one that's closest to the pitch, the catcher, excuse me, if that foot is open up or that toe is pointing back to that catcher, think about it for a minute. To hit the inside pitch, what do you have to do? You have to rotate and get the ball out front. You have to. Well, if you have opened up your back foot, what that's going to promote, because he'll never have time to rotate and get on his toe and ten toes and get the bat head out front. What that's going to promote is if he's opened up here, he's going to roll on that backside and he's going to have a dead backside. So what does that tell you? Hey, right fielder, come on in tight. Come on in tight. Because he's going to get jammed and he's going to hit a little flare, maybe in the right field, maybe in the end field. Because he just can't get the bat hit out. That's where I start. And then I just start moving my way up their body. Moving my way up their body to see if I can find out. Now, let, let me say this. Most of us in here, me included, we probably had to coach football or still have to coach football at some time. I still have to. I had actually retired from football and then got guilted back into it. But you will know that if you coach defense for a length of time and you have some concept of what defenses do, and then you go over to the offensive side of the ball, you see things a whole lot clearer. You know how to attack people. And it's vice versa. I think the best offensive and defensive coordinators had to spend some time on the opposite side of the football so they can understand what you're trying to accomplish on your side of the football. <laughs> so as me talking to you about how are we going to attack someone as a pitcher, I try to relay that to my hitters. I will tell you right up front, I've been around for a while, and, and, and when I first started, when Lakewood was the high school that I was at, <coughs> um, one of the first years that Lakewood was in existence, they were predicting that our enrollment was going to go up, never did. But we were putting the conference with the Columbia schools. We're in Suffolk, I'm in Suffolk by the way, 
but wasn't solved. And one of the schools that we played was Dutch Fork High School. <coughs> and Al Berry was there, a legend. Learned a lot from Al. Al was the first guy I ever saw that taught the no stride. Later on, I saw the uh, Doyle brothers out of Florida. They were teaching no stride. And, and their philosophy was, you don't stride in a golf ball, so why would you stride in a baseball? I listened to that. I saw Al's teams that were very good, very smart kids. But still, I thought the, the stride was necessary as a timing mechanism. Okay? Yeah, golfers don't strive, but I don't see anybody throwing a golf ball at them to see if they can hit it back at them. Okay? So I, I said, you know, no strive is pretty good. I just, you know, I think we need to time it. That's a timing mechanism. I need to load, pick it up, put it down. But here's the problem. I've watched so many kids now. You can tell them until they are blue in the face, get that foot down. And they'll still get it down late. They still will get it down late. If their hands are moving and their foot's not down already, they're in trouble. They're in trouble. Okay? So, I started noticing kids strive. Same thing I just talked about. If when their stride, that front foot opens any at all, hips are off, hips away. If their stride and their head moves forward, same thing as that big first baseman from North Carolina. If his head's moving forward, where is his weight going? It's moving forward, all speed's gonna give him a really hard time. If he's striding and he's hitting, and his front leg is bent, that means where is his weight? On his front side. Now, it's not always going to work. It's, we've got to locate. But if we can locate and we can get his weight out front, we're not going to get anything squared up on the back. We've got to get off that bad head. Um, I saw kids Striding, especially when you get the younger kids, they kind of pick up on. I think this is something they pick up when they're real little. It's a physical development thing. When they see the ball coming in, <clears throat> excuse me, they feel like they have to go get it. They just, you know, just like a little kid, you, you roll them around ball when they're real little. They just have to sit there, and if it rolls six inches this way, they just physically are not developing enough to go. Just away for it, you get a roll it into their glove. But when they're hitting, they feel like they've got to go get the ball. So if they stride in, and they stride in, and I've got a catch right, I haven't worked on this week, he's closing off his hips. First thing he does is he strides into the plate. Now his hips are closed off. How does he correct that? by casting his hands because that's the only way he can get his hands out front. He's got to cast them and get long. Kid never could figure out the other day. Coach, what am I doing wrong? Oh, getting jammed. And I kept watching, watching back up farther in the cage, farther in the cage. He, he was almost up against the cage like I'm up against the screen. And he's, you know, I can't get the head on the back getting jammed. I said, son, you're jamming yourself. I said, you're closing off your hips. So what we actually did to kind of fix him for a moment was I just told him to look. Put your toe out even with your instep. Now when you stride, or when you pick your foot up, you're back here. Right? But after looking at all of this, a few years ago, we, my first year in season, which by the way, I, I, my, my, my school won't make a big deal about me speaking at conference because you don't see a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, you don't see a lot of skis at private schools at, at these clinics. And uh, 
Let me tell you this. I spent 20 years in the public school and then had an opportunity to go to this private school. And being that I'm a, a redneck and I love deer hunting, I'm just telling you right now, there's nothing better than coaching a small rural school with a lot of rich farmers. <laughs> they, what they see as a nuisance animal, I see as a good time. Coach, would you mind coming over here and shooting some of these deer? You know, I'll just have to suck it up and do it. <laughs> so, you know, and another thing, don't, don't take, don't take private schools because I can just drive them nuts. And when I found out when I got there, it, there's going to be some bad ones, but there's going to be some good ones. I had three kids last year that signed two with Division I, all three were pitchers, two with Division I programs, one that would have signed with Division I programs, but he's about as dumb as a bag of hammers. Uh, in our state championship series, unfortunately, we lost. There turned out to be six Division I players playing in that tournament, in that game, in that series. So they usually, I mean, you can find bad ones, trust me. But there's some good ones there, too. But they've got some kids that can play. But uh, my school's making a pretty big deal about me speaking of this. I told them the other day that they want pictures. So, uh, they won't put it in the paper. I, I'm just like totally embarrassed. Golly. But what I learned as hitting, it doesn't make any difference. Hitters are hitters. Hitters are hitters, and we've got to get them out. That's it. We've got to let them get themselves out. That's the main thing. Alright, so we talked about the foot placement, we talked about the stride. I, I'll be honest with you, we went down a few years ago, first year I was in season, we were playing a team out of North Charleston, Northwoods. They had a left-handed catcher. And that was the first flag that went off. He <laughs> got a left-handed catcher. You've got to be kidding me. We are going to run on this kid like he's crazy. Turns out he was pretty good. A couple of first basements. And, and we could run him. He had very good feet. Very quick feet. But anyway, he's here lead off him. And I watch him. He's a little fella. He takes his feet and he spreads them out. And you see him load. And he just goes straight from that. Boom. We had some pretty good pitches. Like I said, our, our school is predominantly a baseball school. We, we have kids sign and move. Most of you in that Sumter, Clarendon County area, that's a pretty good area for baseball. The kid goes 8 for 10 in the series. And he struck out the first time in the play. The only other out he made in the series, our pitcher actually missed the pickoff signal. We were going inside move to second. Short, our second baseman breaks for the bag and the kid lines into a double play. He lines it to our second baseman who's standing on second base. That's the only two outs he made. And I know what you think. You, go, you can't get any generate any power. Look, this was a little tiny. He was not very good. Very quick kid. He had, because I went back and charted it because I started watching. This is when I started really paying attention. How do I want to teach him? He had doubles to left center. I think he had two to left center, two to right center, two singles up the middle, a single to left, and a single to right. Yeah, well, these went um, all right in the pictures he was facing. Yep. Uh, unfortunately, that's another trait in my school. We just don't have left handed kids. Okay? But he never, he, he just very simple, boom, go, bam. So I talked to Michael Johnson, Clemson, and I started watching so many kids mess themselves up on the stride. I just don't teach it anymore. And I started looking. They're getting their foot that way, they're getting their foot open, they're closing their hips off. 
So I teach my hair, I say, okay, get in your stance. Now, stride like you would normally stride. Don't move your foot again. All I want you to do is load up on your toe. All I'm taking away from them is I don't want them to pick it up and put it down because they'll mess it up. We just load on our toe and go from there. Try to keep our weight back. Okay? Because that's, like I said, to be able to teach hitting, you got to understand a little bit about pitching. And if a kid's going to allow me to get him out, He's going to get himself out by stride. Then what am I losing by taking the stride away from him? He's already in out. Now, we, we, we can hit a bat. If we don't locate, we can run into a hit a bat. But at least I'm going to try to keep it off that bat here. Okay? Now, I move on up a little bit further. I watch a kid's shoulder. You would think it would be fairly simple. It's, it's not rocket science. Everything in hitting is about getting this part of the bat to the baseball. That's, that's all hitting is. Getting the sweet spot on the ball, especially now with the BB Cole. As a pitcher, I tell the kids during the summer, God bless the BB Cole. Okay? Because they have made a lot of what we would probably consider <coughs> mediocre high school pitchers into successful high school pitchers. I had a kid one time that played for me, and Greg Dozier was a villain. We're playing in the last day of a preseason tournament. He's nationally ranked. He's got just athletes out the yin yang. L.A. Owens was one of them. And I had a couple of basketball players. So I'm out of pitch, four games a week. So honestly, I asked for a show of hands. Anybody here ever pitched? And I had one little old backup second base to set. Coach, I pitched in all, you know, I pitched in all stars when I was in Little League. I said, son, you got to start. <laughs> he said, but I, I don't, I don't know if I'll be able to get them out. I mean, by this time they're there and they're warming up. And I'm sitting there going, I don't know if this is a baseball game or a football game. Because they all look like wide receiver DBs. I mean, they just look fast and athletic. So he goes down there. I'm, I'm kind of a nervous type anyway. I get nervous to get real quiet for games. And I'm always worried about everything. I didn't even want to go to the bullpen. Because I didn't want to see what was fixing to happen. <laughs> so the first time I saw him throw a pitch was his first pitch of the game. I didn't even watch him warm up. And the young man in the crew, he probably topped out about 63, 64. And he kept beating in the dirt. Beating two strikes. Didn't walk anybody. He just kept throwing it up there. They pop it up. They beat him in the dirt. The third time through the order, the leadoff guy comes to the plate. I think it's the fifth inning. One out. We're winning 3 1 against a national ranked team with a little lead pitcher on the mound. Third time through the order, the leadoff hitter came up. Two outs, thank goodness. And I believe he tried to tear the wall down in the right field. He just smoked. I almost sprinted to the mound, pulled him out, brought a kid in that probably threw 81, and you would have thought their players were facing someone throwing 105. Because after 63, it probably looked like 105. And you will remember. Y'all know you can remember that kid. He pitched against y'all numerous times. AC4 was a powerhouse. I didn't have anybody going to throw a vine. So I just sent him out there for four innings. And the kid ended up having a nice career. The only thing I ever had to tell him as a pitcher during a game 
is I have to go out every once in a while and tell them, I go, you're throwing a little too hard. <laughs> you're getting pretty close to the BP speed. Come on, let's, let's back it down a little bit there, okay? Now, I remember that particular year, he went like five and two, and I had the same kid come behind me every single time. A little left-handed kid I had, but it looked like he was going 90 miles an hour. Okay? If you throw strikes with BB cords with BP, it's that simple. It ain't got to be 100. I get so frustrated. Um, I don't know if Hartsville High School is here, but I saw a kid in camp a few weeks ago up in Clemson. I watched him throw. He threw three pitches for location. Very effortless. Threw very well. Little kid, I can't remember his name. He comes over. I said, come here for a minute. I said, let me, let me ask you something. Tell me if I, how close I'm hitting here. I said, you throw seven innings. You probably give up three to four hits. Probably strike out from five to seven. And you probably end up with a pitch total of about, I'd say, between 65 and 70. He says, Coach, you're exactly right. He's the guy, he's 81, 82, and I hate to say this, his father comes up to me later and he goes, Coach, what do we need to do? <clears throat> Nobody's really looking at it because he was 81, 83, 84. Turns out, I believe he told me he went 12 and 0 last year. So me on my face. I, I can't remember the kid's name. Coke. Uh, it just kind of reminded me of Tom Gladden. Because Tom Gladden would never break a sweat. Never break a sweat. He was just effortless, nice and smooth. Everything came out of his hand. Everything looked the same. He's the kid that you look up at the sixth center and you go, wow. We haven't scored. What's going on? He's not throwing that hard, but he is the kid that the BB core has really made successful. Well, he can throw three pitches to the other end. But that's what I'm talking about. BB cores have brought pitching back into the game. So as we move up, here's what I see from a lot of kids at Cape. And I ask them, why are you doing this? Man, why, why, why are you doing all that? I don't know. I, I, I see it on TV. Too. In fact, I asked the young one to tell me that. Well, so-and-so on the major league is doing it. These kids have no idea how superior an athlete is to make it to the major leagues. They've never seen one. I've seen a couple of guys come back out and take BP. And I tell you, wow, it's, it's unbelievable. It is unbelievable how good you have to be to reach that level. They're not the normal baseball player. They're not. Justin Smokes and kids that have come through South Carolina and makes it there as a hitter. They're, they're very, very special. They can have mistakes here, and because of their hand eye coordination, they can fix it <coughs> in the swing. I talked to Michael, like I said, I talked to Michael Johnson, who's a great hitter at Clemson. I said, Michael, how about this move? He said, Barry, here's the point. It's all about getting the bat head to the ball. So if he's wiggling that bat, that bat head is never in the same spot at any point. He said, you may start your swing this time, and the bat head's here. Next time, it's there. Next time, it's there. How can you... How can you consistently hit a ball when the one place you need to get to the baseball is constantly moving? Going back to my redneck ways, I'd much rather shoot a deer standing still than running. They tend to be a lot easier to hit. Okay? 
Uh, so I look for that. He's wiggling that back. He's getting real late with that. Where is it hardest to hit a ball? Father is from your eyes. I tell my hitters, look down the way and adjust. Now, do we get jammed sometimes? Yeah, we do. <coughs> but we're going to take the hardest location away from them to hopefully be able to adjust inside and get the head. Okay? So, I'm looking for this. I'm looking for their hands up. I'm looking for their hands back. If they've got their hands back, now you see this, they have bridged out. They're going to get around the ball. Okay? They're going to have to elongate that swing. If they've got their hands up, this ain't rocket science, folks. We've all seen baseball players that weren't very bright. If you move that bat up, you better have some real strong hands. You better be strong because what I've done is I've taken that bat head away from that contact zone. So I'm making it take me longer to get there. Funny thing is, you see these little JV kids, they'll have that bat up there real high when they start. Because, you know, they, they used to play right ball. They can get the bad head out. But if you got your hands up, you, you, better, be, you better have some quick hands. Because I'm going to come right up under your hands because that's where you've got the father's distance to go to get that sweet spot to the ball. Okay? I'm making it stop with All right? Um, I had to look at my watch. My wife asked me, she said, did you prepare a speech? I said, sweetheart, I can talk baseball all day long. She said, really? You got 55 minutes. I said, sweetheart, I can talk about Article 1 of the Constitution of Government class for 90 minutes. I think I've got this. I think I can talk about hitting for 55 pitching for 55 minutes. You see a lot of this. I don't know where it came from. The kids with the bad head, even with their hands, or below. I don't know where that came from. But when they've got their hands, that bad head, even with their hands, or below, the first thing that's going to happen when they start their swing is that front elbow is going to come up. And that bad head's going to go away. Dang. So anything that I throw them away, what's going to happen? Foul to the right side, up. Foul, you see it. Watch them going. When that bad head gets below those hands, it's here. And that's, that's not good. That's not going to be successful. If you, if you, you know, uh, here again, I'm dating myself a little bit. Carl and Fisk played for Boston Red Sox, Chicago White Sox. And when Carlton was in his prime, Sports Illustrated wrote an article on him, showing him he was from somewhere in New England, I can't remember which state. And his regiment was every day, he had a pair of work gloves, and he went out there and he just hacked on trees with an axe. Well, that was, that was good old age. When, when you, didn't, you didn't have to lift weights and take steroids and all these things. That was his normal regimen of workouts during the summer. Just taking, taking that axe and working on those trees. Well, you're not going to swing an axe from here. Where are you going to swing an axe from? Right there. So if I see a kid that's here or here, then I know he, he's not going to catch up with anything inside. He's just put himself in a situation where he's going to get himself out. And I'm going to allow him to do that. I'm going to give him fastballs until he proves to me that he can hit it. I understand that last night we were in here, a guy from USC Sports Medicine talked about, <coughs> talked about baseball injuries. 
you know, I want to have a curveball. I want my pitcher to have a curveball. I especially want them to have a changeup. But one, I'm not going to throw it for a strike going once or twice a game just to prove to them that we can throw it for a strike. And the rest of the time, unless they make me throw it for a strike, I won't throw it for a strike. I don't want to throw it for a strike. I'm going to let you try to hit my fastball. I want you to hit my changeup. If I see that hand float forward, I want to attack him first with a changeup. I want to get them off balance. Um, I, the young man is sitting right over here. Curtis Johnson played with me at Lakewood and then went on and, and played with uh, Carol. <coughs> and I'll never forget, we were playing this gentleman right here, Bob Clank, that could wait for uh, West Barnes. And, and I threw Curtis, Curtis was my ace. And, 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 and I hate to say this, it wasn't really a secret what we were going to do when he was on the mound. We were going to get ahead for a fastball. We might throw a slider, probably not, mine, I don't know. But when we went 0 2, and I still remember, I still remember it's clear as a bell. Bob hollering out, he's going high, he's going high. We throw a fastball, though, right here. And we change his eye angle. <coughs> and then the next pitch is 1 2. Our next pitch is going to be fastball down the way. Change his eye angle, we're going down the way. Curtis threw it, and I don't mean that bad about Curtis. <laughs> Curtis was 88, 89, touch 90. Wasn't particularly, he did a real good job of hiding the baseball. Had a huge heart, huge heart on the mound. That talked me out of one game in our place. I, I went out to take him out, he goes, No, I got this. I said, You sure about this? Like, the uh, base is loaded, nobody out. Are you sure about this? Coach, go sit back down. I got this. I promise. I don't know about this, man. And I don't like being talked out of it. I go sit back down in case the next three minutes. You remember that? That, that, wasn't, that wasn't building. That was hard. But that's, we're not going to get cute. We're not going to get cute. We're going to figure out what your weakness is, and we're going to attack it. And we're going to attack it. We're not going to try to get cute. We're going to find, we're going to make sure right now, y'all had the pleasure of that, uh, y'all were pretty much fully practiced. We're a little bit behind. We still got the three man room. I'm still standing in the waiting room. I'm there out in Long Tulsa. I take three down to the cage, and one walks up, and I have to get off and leave. So we're, we're still dealing with that in our classification. But we were able to start Monday. And right now, we're throwing short men, short distance, working on mechanics, and working on fastball grips and change-up grips. We will probably go into our preseason tournament still just throwing fastballs and change-up because I've got to have them master those two pitches. We have got to be able to throw a strike with our fastball eight out of ten times. If you're on varsity, you should be able to locate your fastball seven out of ten times. And I'm not getting picky. All I'm asking, I call inside, you throw inside. I call outside, you throw outside. I'm not asking them to break a screen or put it in an inch and a half spot or nothing like that. That's for the college coaches to get them to do that. I just try to make them successful now. I, most, most teams we face, we really got to worry about three or four hitters. Once you get past four or five, they're just out for eight and a half. They're, they're just out for eight and a half. <coughs> you know it, I know it. I got the same thing on my team. I've had one team in all of my years of coaching that I felt like we could hit one through eight. One team. Bless his heart, the team that Curtis played on, had great pitchers, ended up having two division one pitchers on the same staff. 
We beat good teams, two to one, three to one. We beat bad teams, five to nothing. They couldn't get more than we saw out of the boat. And I knew it. We could pitch, we could play defense. They couldn't hit. They just couldn't do it. We were slow, couldn't hit, and, but we could play defense. And that's what we, we, we aggressively attack people, and we were very successful. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody? Yeah. That's a very good question, Amy. Yeah. Nobody can use the tag out as we walk from the pits and next time. Steam kit, right? It worked. It worked. That's right. Not gonna get beat by that guy. I got I, I got to move the got to move those feet. Got to move those feet. I'm not saying, you know, what I learned in college was, if you throw it to hair and feet, they'll get out the way of it. <laughs> if you want to hit them, throw it to ribs. Right, Curtis? This is sophomore. He wore a blood chewing after the game because he wouldn't pitch inside. I think for the rest of his career, he probably had his hit two or three. Right? But I got to move his feet or his hands. Alright? I mean. I hate to say this, Andy, and you know this probably too. If I hit him, I got to take care of two and four. I can't let that guy beat me. I can't give in to him. Because if he's crowding that play, he's wanting to get those arms extended out over that play. So I can't let him have what he wants to have. I got to throw him inside. If I hit him, I hit him. If I don't, just try not to put myself in a situation where him getting on base. I mean, people are 3 0 hitters for a reason. They're your best hitters. If we do what we should do, has it always going to work out that way? No. No. I still remember me and Denny Beckley hooking up in a great game in Camden, went extra innings, and the game we lost the game on fastball. Yeah. It happens. Catcher felt terrible. Last year, believe it or not, uh, I lost the state championship. In the ninth inning, on bases loaded, hit basket. The first thing I did was I went to my pitcher and I said, Son, you do not put your head down. If it had not been for you, we would not have been in this situation. I had played with it all night long. Same thing we talked about. They had one good hitter I knew, and they had two bad hitters behind them. So I, Twice, at least two or three times, I walked the bases loaded with one out. And this kid came the next two. We got a pop up. We got out of the end. One time he failed. And that kid, senior, felt crushed. And I made sure I went to him immediately. And I told him, You have nothing to be ashamed of. You just pitch so hard. I wanted to. I'm about out of time, but I wanted to bring something up. I want you to think about this. Okay? This past season, I mean, I'm sorry. I'm already getting choked up. This coming season is going to be very difficult in my high school. Back during the football season, I spoke to one of my senior ball players on Friday afternoon. I asked him, what are you doing this weekend? I'm going to Clemson to go see a football game. Great. Call him Cobra. He goes to Clemson. He does something that we would all do. He leaves the ball game. Traffic's bumper to bumper. He forgets to put his seatbelt on. He's heading over to Anderson to meet with his family. His father is in the vehicle behind him. Pizza delivery guy cuts him off, truck flips. He's not buckled. He's killed. He's pinned underneath the vehicle. I get that call Saturday night. Now, this kid was not a ball player. He was not a ball player. He was a good kid who worked in the weight room, he 
playing every time I pass his house. He's out in the yard playing with his little brother and sister. He is the best kid, and we all know kids in our school that should question why him and not them. They are a waste of life. Now, we started practice this week. This kid was a pitcher only, we call him. He really wasn't a pitcher. He's a good kid. When we took Mass Infield, he stood right there behind that golf, our shopping cart, and he fed our coaches because we weren't on our infield. That's all he did. I think he threw three innings last year. I think he might have had two of the bats, and he was just happy as he could be. He kept our scoreboard. That's, that was his job. And the reason I tell you this is you make sure that those kids know that you love them. Because if you don't, then you're doing the wrong job. You're, doing the, you're not doing your job justice. That's the third kid out there over here. And they don't get no easy. <coughs> I came home last two weeks ago and I told my wife, I said, I think I'm going to get out of this. I don't want to do this anymore. She said, what's wrong? I said, I can't help but get close to my kids. So, maybe I should just, if I quit doing it, maybe I won't be as close to them. And she said, you know, that boy would want that act. He wouldn't. He wouldn't. He said, for every kid that you lose, you probably made a difference in a few more. You can cheat the ones that you didn't go to. But it's, you, you make sure that you speak to them. That's the beauty of private schools. We can say prayer. We can pray. I know when I went to public school, private school, the first time we did this, I about freaked out because I thought, oh my God, we're going to have somebody complain. Then I realized I was in a different situation. But, you know, a lot of kids look at me as this rough, gruff guy that doesn't smile. But I make sure that when those kids leave that ballpark, they know what I care about. And we should not keep that inside. Because you don't ever know when that's the last time you will get to see that kid. And I promise you, if you haven't already done this, you know that that's the nature of our business. We're going to lose kids. I don't mean we have to like it. The only thing that saved me is I needed this boy was a Christian, and I'm going to see him again. But that stop me from missing this year. So that's what I ask you to do as coaches. We have so much influence over our lives. Just make sure that one, we're influenced in the right way, and two, that they know that we care about more than wins or losses. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed seeing so many of y'all again. I miss you. Um, appreciate Eddie asking me today. And uh, I hope you picked something up from it. And uh, have a good season. Thank you.